We are in the book of Acts, and this is written by Luke, who also wrote the gospel according to Luke. And this is a continuation of what happened after Christ's uh, passion and resurrection. Here you had men of God now that had to stand on their own two feet, and they had to figure it out (laughs) and get it for themselves. And it's also going to talk about how God sent the Holy Spirit back to fill his people when the day of Pentecost was fully come. Okay? And this is a history of the early church. So without any further ado, let's get started. Luke says, The former treatise have I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach. Okay, let's stop right there. When the Gospel of Luke was written, Luke was also writing to this gentleman, Theophilus, who was probably some kind of, oh, some kind of ruler in the area, somebody who had power, because in Luke he called him most excellent Theophilus. He was probably a judge or a, uh, maybe a, a highfalutin magistrate or uh, some kind of governor. In today's terms, maybe like the governor of the state of California or the mayor of L.A., somebody like that. Somebody who is honorable, somebody who has a position of authority, okay? Until the day in which he was taken up, after that he, through the Holy Ghost, had given commandments unto the apostles whom he had chosen. The ones he chose were the ones that got the work done. Uh Uh-huh. Many are called, but few are chosen. And the call is going out today. Um, It's really up to you whether God will choose you. Can you be and will you be chosen of God? Are you willing to, first of all, be chosen to do his work? And will you fulfill all the necessary requirements in order for God to be able to choose you, to be able to work with you, and to, to be able to anoint you to go out and do his work as well? This is how it works. To whom... Also, he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs, being seen of them forty days, and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. That was an interesting forty days. And he did do this. It talks about in some of the other gospels how after his resurrection, he showed up and, and uh, explained some things to his disciples and to a bunch of the people that followed him and knew him. and were instructed by him. And he made everything plain because when he was crucified, that was an awful blow to the disciples and some of the women that that followed with him and ministered to him and learned from him. They didn't quite get it. They weren't converted fully until that Holy Ghost uh, was given on the day of Pentecost, which is where we'll get to eventually. He showed himself alive after his suffering, his passion, by many unmistakable proofs, and those are all in the Gospels as well, being seen of them 40 days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. He would expound the Old Testament scriptures about himself to his disciples so that they could understand that all the prophecies that the old prophets had prophesied about the coming of Christ and the Messiah were true. Mm -hmm. And they were fulfilled in certain ways that, that made everything provable, that made everything add up decently and in order. Not at all confusing, by the way. And being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which, saith he, you have heard of me. For John truly baptized with water, that's John the Baptist, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. In a, in a very short time, you'll get that baptism of the Holy Spirit. And that was the promise of God the Father, that eventually the Holy Spirit would come and make us able to be obedient to what God wanted. Very simply put, God wanted his men and women, his people, just to obey him and to remember him and and serve him and worship him as God so that he would be their God and they would be his people. He didn't want them sinning. (laughs) And that's why he created some rules at first. First, it was the Ten Commandments. Well, the people couldn't do those ten. They tried. Tried as they might, they really couldn't do it. So then, 
He made them give sacrifices for their sins, and maybe they'd change their ways then. Make them too busy to do too much sinning. See what I'm saying? Give them, uh, give them something to do if they did sin. Okay? And uh, to take, you know, a, a lamb or a, a sheep or even an ox or a side of beef out of their flock and take it out of their financial living and out of their, uh, you know, kind of take it out of their hide, so to speak. Um, so you didn't want to do too much sinning because it, it would cost you in the natural. Well, the word also says to obey is better than sacrifice and to hearken, to listen up, than the fat of rams. See what I'm saying? God, all God wants is for us to just simply obey this word. And since he sent back the Holy Ghost to, to fill us with his spirit, we are to be just like he is in sinless perfection in our natural lives here. Mm -hmm. And the old man dies off and the new man, Jesus Christ, takes over. And we do the same things that he does. And he gives, he gives us the same abilities, the same power, the same authority, everything. It's amazing what he does. And the power to overcome sin and to pass it by and say, no, that's not what I want. I know where I want to spend eternity. I'm not going to do these sins and, and send my soul into a habitation that isn't suitable for eternity because that's a long, 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 long time. That's forever. Once this body dies, that's it. Okay, so we want our soul to be ready to be able to receive that eternal habitation in glory with Jesus Christ, with him in his throne like he promised he would deliver to overcomers. See, we in this ministry don't consider ourselves sinners. Mm -mm. No way. We're overcomers. We overcome that sin. And if we happen to unknowingly goof up here and never just say, oh, Lord, forgive me and just move on. But it's not an excuse to sin, though. See what I'm saying? We don't willingly sin. Especially when we know better. Okay? So, this is what all this stuff about the Holy Ghost is about. Um, when they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? <laughs> That's an interesting question. It really is. Why? They were under Roman occupation during this time. <laughs> and every time the children of Israel, the Jewish people, God's initially chosen people, any time that they did not obey the Lord <laughs> and the men that the Lord sent to lead them, such as Moses, you know, different prophets here and there to guide them, the Lord would allow a foreign nation to overrun them. And that, that's not a pleasant uh, situation. What if we were overrun by a foreign country today? That would, that would not be a good thing. You see what I'm saying? If the Chinese decided to invade, you know, we would be looking for a Messiah to deliver us from that political and military occupation. This is what these folks were talking about. However, before Jesus was crucified, he told Pontius Pilate, the Roman governor of the area, he told him, he said, my kingdom is not of this world. It's a spiritual thing. And the word also says the kingdom of God is within man, that infilling of the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. And all of you are going to have a chance tomorrow to be filled with the Holy Ghost through full immersion water baptism. It's the first step in your commitment in a walk with God. And what that does for you is you are baptized in water, by somebody, by any, any one of these guys here, or myself, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter who does it. But any one of these guys here, or myself, somebody that's filled with the Holy Ghost. So that, that can be passed on to you, so that you can be full of the Holy Ghost. And when you're filled to overflowing with the Holy Ghost, there's no room for anything else in there. See what I'm saying? There's no room for any other bad stuff. It takes over completely, and it teaches you everything you need to know. Mm -hmm. It's true. This is what all the big deal over the Holy Ghost is. A lot of places say, well, you don't need it that anymore. That was just for the old apostles. That's garbage. That's an absolute lie. You do need to be filled with the Holy Ghost in order to even understand this word. See? That's the first thing I want you guys to do. Because it's, it's for your benefit. Um, 
And I tell you, the benefits outweigh anything that you set aside to do in order to serve the Lord. So they were asking him here, are you going to restore again the kingdom to Israel? He says, no. <laughs> mm -mm. Here's his reply. It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power or his own authority, but you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. This is a really fantastic and interesting statement that Jesus just made here. It really is. He says, don't worry about the political issues that you're seeing now because of this Roman occupation. Don't even give it the second thought. He says, I'm going to put my kingdom within you. You become a nation. And you decide what kind of government you're going to serve. You're going to serve Jesus Christ with the, with the, the spirit that he sent back, the Holy Ghost? Or are you going to serve some other spirit? See. <laughs> yeah. Are you going to be occupied by the kingdom of God, the true Israel, that new Jerusalem that you, you guys are? and are becoming, or are you going to be occupied by some Roman deity, some other god, some other thing? You see what I'm saying? Some other foreign occupying force, if you will, right? Does that make sense? That's kind of an interesting way to put it, I think. You become a nation, and you decide what you're going to be occupied by. <laughs> What's going to rule and reign over you? The only thing that should rule and reign over you is Jesus Christ and his Holy Spirit. Mm hmm Yeah. So this is interesting. And he's also telling him here in verse 8, the last part of verse 8, he's telling him, you're going to go out and you're going to be witnesses to me. Mm hmm You're going to go out and preach the gospel. My dispensation is over. Now it's your, your turn to go out and to be carbon copies of me, to replicate me, <laughs> and do it with your own personalities, by the way, to be individuals. <laughs> Another interesting side note is about Apostle Paul in his writings, which we'll probably cover later on if you stick around. Uh, he was a stickler for your individuality, for you to get everything that you can get from God and then go out and, and give that to others to keep those sparks flying. Mm -hmm. and to keep lighting those flames everywhere. Mm -hmm. First, the, the Lord fills you with the Holy Ghost and with fire, and then you get to set the world on fire. You get to go out and just have at it. <laughs> it's great. And you bring that blessing of God into people's lives. Now, I don't know why more people wouldn't want to do this, but apparently some of them don't have time, or they're too busy, or they're making too much money, or there's too many phone calls coming in, and all kinds of distractions out there. That's the work of the devil. He likes to distract. He likes to distract you away from what the Lord is doing, what the Lord would like you to do. However, as a sovereign nation, you have a choice over who you want to serve. <laughs> yeah. You can either drink the cup of the Lord or the cup of devils, but you can't drink both of them. You've got to choose one way or the other. So make the right choice today. And when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. <laughs> and while they looked steadfastly toward heaven, as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel. A couple of angels here. Which also said, you men of Galilee, <laughs> why stand you gazing up into heaven? <laughs> This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as you have seen him go into heaven. Mm -hmm. Well, you see him going up. It's just as easy for him to go up. And actually, it's just as easy for him, when you go under that water, to come straight back down into you and occupy your earthen vessel, this body here, this flesh that you have. <laughs> and that old body of sin goes away 
And you become part of the body of Christ then. Mm -hmm. You become part of his body. You become his hand or his foot or his eyes and ears. Mm -hmm. And you actually become his right-hand man. When you're well-seasoned, you, you go out there and start doing the work, the same kinds of works that he did. It's an awesome thing. And I, I could go on all day about it and try to tell you how great it is, but you've got to experience it for yourself. It is, in fact, better felt than tell at this point. <laughs> so, how much can we get from just a few scriptures? A lot. We're not going to stop there. Then returned they unto Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, the Mount of Olives, which is from Jerusalem a Sabbath day's journey, <laughs> about uh, two-thirds of a mile. You couldn't walk very far on the Sabbath day. You could hardly do any work. In fact, the old religious leaders of Jesus' day didn't want him even doing any good works on the Sabbath day. <laughs> Little did they know they were talking to the Lord of the Sabbath. They were talking to Jesus Christ, the man who wrote the rule book and then tore it up. That's right. In fact, those old religious leaders of Jesus' day were the guys who added more rules and regulations to what was already there. Uh -huh. And things that they made up as they went along and justified the things that they made up as a so-called oral tradition given to Moses by God on the mountain. Mm -hmm. Steve and I studied that out one night uh, and found it quite interesting. And they elevated their own things that came out of their own natural minds, unanointed, without the benefit of the Holy Ghost, absolute man's natural mind getting in there and elevated those rules and those regulations up above the actual written law that God did give to Moses and that Moses diligently wrote down and kept careful track of and record of. This is where religion is today. The mind of man has gotten in there and messed it all up. They've gone through our Bibles and messed them all up. If you guys have NIVs or NASs or, or uh, any other kind of translation other than the King James, throw it away. It's garbage. Mm -hmm. Do it when you get home, if you have any of that stuff. The good old King James is the best. And that's really all I'm going to say about it for now. Again, these so-called new translations, these new things, are just new and watered down versions of what man thinks the word should say. This King James is the anointed word of God in our language, in English. It's already in English. It doesn't need to be further translated. The words in this King James have the power and have the authority that you need to make it to where you need to get. And that's into the throne of God with Jesus Christ as an overcomer. Any other version isn't going to get there. Any other version that's out there is just going to cause you nothing but grief and confusion. Please trust me on this. Please. Mm-hmm. You've experienced it? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, listen up. He's, he's had his difficulties with other things. This is the way to go. This is, and I, I can only tell you from my own experience, well, these guys can also tell you with their own word of their own testimony that this is what works. I mean, these guys will all nod when I, this is what works. Yeah, they know. They know for themselves, not just because I say so. And I know for myself, not just because anyone else told me. I learned all of this stuff on my own. I was well taught, but I also learned a lot of things, you know, through experience and through my own studies and things. And I have found this to be most excellent. <laughs> okay. So we got all that from the Sabbath day. <laughs> all right, that's fine. <laughs> Um, yeah, the Sabbath day's journey is typical of where religion takes you. In other words, when you go to church, you can only walk two-thirds of a mile. Hey, what if I want to run uh, 10 miles? Oh, no, you can't do that. You stay way back here. Don't you dare break that finish line. See what I'm saying? Interesting way to look at it. You're going to run a race. You're not going to run half the race and stop and dig your heels in and go, well, I'm not going any further. No. We're going to break that tape at the end of the race. 
We're going to cross that finish line. <sighs> yeah, that's what we're out to do today, is to cross the finish line. And to get there, we got to run. And we got to run like mad and not let anything stop us on down the road. And here we, so here we go. Bang, I just fired the starting gun. Everybody run. Okay, let's go. Sabbath day's journey. That's that old religion. See what I mean? I'm getting a lot out of this. That's, it was only two-thirds of a mile. That's not very far. But that's what you get today in religious so-called churches. You get a Sabbath day's journey. You get a little bit. Yeah, full gospel. Yeah, a thimble full. See what I mean? Not here you don't. Here you can get as much as you would like. There's no limit. There's no stopping. Steve and I call it extreme Bible study because we don't have to stop anywhere. We don't have to be satisfied with just a little bit, with just a two-thirds of a mile. No, if we want to run the whole decathlon, let's do it. If we want to jump on a bicycle, let's do it. If we want to get in that kayak, let's do it. If we want to go out and go ice skating, let's go. You see what I'm saying? We're not limited by the Sabbath day's journey here. See what I mean? You could only do certain things. Very limited. And that's where religion had gotten in Jesus' day. And this, in this book of Acts, is where we're going to find out how the men of God broke that tape and got rid of that old-timey religion and started serving God, finally, the way God wanted his people to serve him. Mm -hmm. Through that obedience. Okay? And when they were come in, they went up into an upper room where abode both Peter and James and John and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus and Simon Zelotus and Judas the brother of James. Um, again, we can sort out all these names later. Um, you had disciples here, okay? These all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary the mother of Jesus and with his brethren. Even Jesus' natural relatives had to get it the same way anyone else did, through that prayer and supplication to God. They didn't automatically have a pass just because they were Jesus' relatives. <laughs> At one point, they interrupted him while he was ministering. They were on the outside looking in and weren't getting what they needed to get from him during that time. And Jesus said, what do you mean my mother and my brother are outside looking and wanting to talk to me? I'm ministering here. My mother and my brethren are those here that are hearing the word of God and doing it. See, his natural family wasn't doing anything. Not anything worthwhile, except at that point, bugging him. <laughs> they weren't anything special until chapter 2 here. When we get to chapter 2, verse 38, that's what makes you special <laughs> before God. All right? All right. They had one purpose and one mind. Apostle said, let this mind be in you that was also in Christ Jesus. Let it. Paul put it that way for a reason. There are lots of other things that will try to prevent you from allowing that mind of Christ to get in there. <laughs> You'll be on your way to getting baptized and filled with the Holy Ghost, and gosh darn it, that phone will ring, and it'll be something. Just ignore it. It's going gonna, it's gonna to try to seem really important. But I'll tell you what, guys, there's nothing more important than the salvation of your souls. Really. I mean, where do you want to spend eternity? There's nothing more important than that. Your soul is the most precious thing that you can keep and tend to and uh, to nurture so that it grows, to, to make it something that's really special. Because believe me, guys, you may have no idea how precious your souls are to God at this point. You're of utmost importance to him. And anything that you do for him is of utmost importance. There's no other words that I have to describe it right now. It is that important because the harvest is already white out there to harvest. The harvest is already ready, but the laborers are few. 
I've got to get you guys going out there ministering so that we can start reaping this harvest. That's a good way to look at it from an agricultural point of view. It's fine. That's what Jesus told his disciples. He said, you know, what are you guys going to do when I'm gone? You're just going to sit around and do nothing? Or are you going to go out and get those new souls and get them filled with the Holy Ghost and pass that on? Pass that bread of life on down the line (laughs) so that everyone gets fed, everyone that will receive it. And in those days, Peter stood up in the midst of the disciples and said, the number of names together were about 120. This was neat. This is a pretty small number. (laughs) And here, these 120 folks are going to get ready to set the entire world on its ear. The religious world goes upside down, and they're going to set the world on fire, the fire of the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. This is where it's going to start just with about 120. It started with 12. (laughs) He multiplied that by 10 by the time he was resurrected. And now we got 120. It's good. Here's what Peter is going to say. Men and brethren, this scripture must needs have been fulfilled, which the Holy Ghost by the mouth of David spake before concerning Judas, the bad Judas. Uh, Up here, In verse 13, Judas, the brother of James, is uh, the disciple, Jude, who wrote the book of Jude. Well, just before you hit Revelation in the end of the uh, New Testament. Okay, so now that there's no confusion, some of these names sound a little different when they're translated out of the Greek. Maybe by different translators who used different names, and that's as far as I'll go with that. Okay. All right. So Peter's going to talk about a scripture that needs to be fulfilled concerning uh, one of the disciples that did this, which was guide to them that took Jesus. Yep, the guys that took him away to be uh, tried and eventually uh, condemned by Pontius Pilate, the Roman governor. In short, the Jewish people during that time didn't have guts enough to kill him themselves because they had no real reason. So they got the Romans to do it. And that's, in a nutshell, what they did. (laughs) The unbelieving Jews. Now, we've got 120 believers here who are just now waiting for this Holy Ghost to come in. Okay, and he's going to talk about uh, Judas a little bit here. He says, for he, Judas, was numbered with us and had obtained part of this ministry. Okay, that's fine. He says, Now this man purchased a field with the reward of iniquity, the 30 pieces of silver he took from the religious leaders to betray uh, Jesus to them. Okay? And falling headlong, he burst asunder in the midst, and all his bowels gushed out. Uh, This may appear to be a slightly different account than from those in Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John concerning the fate of Judas, because it also says he went out and hung himself. Falling headlong here is probably where they cut him down off of the ropes and he fell down into this field and was probably so decomposed and bloated at that time, he just sort of exploded a little bit. (laughs) Okay, so let's keep confusion and debate out of this, okay? Um, Again, this is something someone can come along in the wrong spirit and say, well, the Bible contradicts itself. No, it doesn't. It just may be separate viewpoints. Okay, so let's keep the connection, you know, uh, sane and rational. And it was known unto all the dwellers at Jerusalem, insomuch as that field is called in their proper tongue, Akeldama, that is to say, the field of blood. And Old Testament scriptures, and Peter is going to bring out this point, do describe... Uh, how Jesus was betrayed, uh, what they did to him, uh, how he was betrayed, everything was already described hundreds of years before. For it is written in the book of Psalms, that's mostly the writings of David and a few other pretty sharp men of God. Let his habitation be desolate and let no man dwell therein and his bishopric, his priesthood or his, um, his dispensation, let another take. So they're going to fulfill the scripture here and they're going to elect uh, the best way that they know how 
somebody to replace Judas. And this is very detailed and very descriptive. So that you guys at first have a, a good understanding of how the word reads, how to understand what's going on, and uh, how to get the full, some of the background of what you may not understand as we go through this, okay? I'm gonna do my best to, to keep this uh, very simple and very clear for you guys. Again, no confusion in this ministry. There isn't any. Okay? Wherefore, of these men which have accompanied with us all the time the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John, unto that same day that he was taken up from us, must one be ordained to be a witness with us of his resurrection. Okay? In other words, we need a guy to fill the traitor's position because we need guys to go out and minister. Peter was on fire. <laughs> Maybe not always had the, the best direction <laughs> in mind. He always had the best intentions in mind. But uh, you know, again, bef before his conversion, Peter was quite the character. <laughs> the fully converted Peter is a fantastic man of God. And here Peter is just a little bit ahead of God's will, through no fault of his own, running a little bit ahead of the will of God. Okay. Peter was like that before his conversion, before he was actually filled with the Holy Ghost. He was speaking always at the wrong time, when he should have kept his mouth shut, uh, denied the Lord when he should have said, yeah, I do know him, you know, um, said things that, that didn't matter much. <laughs> before he was converted. All right. <laughs> and they appointed two, Joseph called Barsabbas, who was surnamed Justice, and Matthias. And they prayed and said, Thou, Lord, which knowest the hearts of all men, show whether or which of these two thou hast chosen. That was a good way to do it. It's always seek the mind of the Lord before doing something. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Consult the Lord first. And you know, when you are filled with His Spirit, you have that Holy Spirit within you constantly, with you 24-7, to consult any time you need. And it will always give you the right answer. <laughs> it's an amazing thing. It's like having all the answers right there within you. It's fantastic. That greatly reduces the probability of you ever making a mistake or doing the wrong thing. If you consult the, the Spirit of the Lord for, constantly for everything, you can't go wrong. He keeps you on that straight and narrow path. And then there's no distraction. Nothing else can get in there and stop you from doing what you need to do. It's great. <laughs> I don't even have words for it. It's utterly fantastic is what it is. Okay, which of these two you've chosen? They gave the Lord the opportunity to make the choice. That he may take part of this ministry and apostleship, from which Judas by transgression fell, that he might go to his own place. Mm -hmm. And they gave forth their lots, and the lot fell upon Matthias, and he was numbered with the eleven apostles. It was kind of their way of, if you want to think of it in today's terms, it was kind of their way of drawing straws. You know, the, sh the store to straw will be the, the guy who wins the, the prize, right? Okay. And what they did, and this is also interesting too, what they did in the Old Testament, they had uh, a couple of things that called the Urim and the Thummim. And there were a couple of like flat or heart-shaped stones, something like that. And they had different things painted on them, like yes or no, or it, it, almost like one of those magic eight balls. Like what you do, you shake it up, and whatever message floats to the top into the little window, that's what it is. Well, what they would do is they would cast the lots, the Urim and Thummim, back in the Old Testament. And whatever they would ask of the Lord, say, Lord, are we going to go into battle and are we going to be victorious today? And they would cast the lot and it flip either yes or no. And wherever that landed, that was the will of God. Should we go down and fight this army? No, that was the will of God, not to go down yet. And the next day they would ask, is today the right day, Lord, to go down and fight this enemy? They'd 
cast it out. Yep. All right, that's the will of the Lord. We're going down. If they couldn't get a man of God to prophesy over them or to give them the mind of God, <laughs> then they would cast these things, and that's how they did it. And so Peter and these other guys now were using a slightly old and antiquated way of uh, determining the mind of God here because they really hadn't gotten the Holy Ghost yet. Not quite. They were this close to getting it. <laughs> okay? So they got this Matthias guy here to replace Judas. And what I finally wanted to end with, with this, the ending of this chapter at least, is uh, Peter said some interesting things. So even though he was a little bit ahead of God's mind, uh, there were still some interesting things that were said and some interesting things that were done. They tried a few different things and experimented a little bit. And I think, if I'm right, the only time you see the word experiment in the Bible is in this book of Acts. They had to figure out certain things, but once it was established, they knew that they were on the right track. <laughs> okay? And back around to my point again as we finish off chapter 1, the Lord actually had somebody already in mind to replace Judas Iscariot, the, the traitor. That was Apostle Paul. That's the guy the Lord wanted. Mm -hmm. That's the man the Lord wanted to replace Judas. This man named, formerly named Saul, and God called him Paul instead. Mm -hmm. Because you don't hear about this Matthias uh, ever doing much of anything at all after this. They tried their experiment and it was f okay for that day and then we move on. So let's go into chapter 2. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. Oh, these 120 here. Mm -hmm. One purpose and one mind. Mm -hmm. They had the mind of the Lord as, far, as much as they could get during that time. And they're going to get a lot more. Just watch. And suddenly... There came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. It's a like a, a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. <laughs> Isn't this great? And there appeared unto them cloven tongues, or divided tongues with two flames on them. Cloven tongues like as of fire, and it sat upon each of them. And then what? Nothing? No. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Mm -hmm. This is for us today as well. When you get full of the Holy Ghost, like these folks just did here, one of the, what they call the manifestation of the Spirit, the, the evidence that you have that you are full of the Holy Ghost is that you will eventually speak with a, uh, a, in a language that you've not learned. Because you'll be full of so much love, so much joy, and so much peace, that it'll come rolling out and you won't know what to say. But what it is, is you, it's your spirit praying directly to God the Father mm -hmm. through the spirit of Jesus Christ, that Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. You can think of it this way. They call it the Holy Ghost because it's, it's kind of like the ghost of Jesus Christ inhabiting you. You know, they, a lot of times they talk about people who are demon-possessed. Well, we are possessed as well. The only, but what we're possessed by is the right spirit, the Holy Spirit of God, see? The Spirit of Jesus Christ. He said, I and my Father are one, and the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are three different manifestations of the same Spirit. Mm -hmm. One Lord, one baptism, one Spirit, see? The right one. It's really that simple. There's the right spirit, and then there's all the wrong ones. Mm -hmm. <laughs> God's got a lot of good spirits. He's got love, joy, peace, meekness, temperance, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith. You know, all the, the gifts and the fruits of the spirit. And the devil has his 18 gifts of the flesh, a substitute for the spirit. Mm -hmm. Paul said to the Galatian church, he said, walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. 
<laughs> and you'll find that in these meetings, I talk a lot about the difference between the flesh and the spirit. Your flesh has to be a container for the spirit of God. However, <laughs> you're going to find this, that at first, the flesh does not want to contain the spirit of God. It does not like to retain God in its knowledge. It doesn't want to have anything to do with it. That's why you've got to go under the water in baptism and get the Holy Spirit. Because the second you go under that water, you're buried with him in baptism, like it says in Romans 6, which we covered in these meetings that you can catch up with. Uh, you come up out of that water, you come up like Jesus came out out of his tomb, full of that resurrection power. Do you know that? Mm -hmm. Full of the same resurrection that he was resurrected with. Oh yeah, no different. Mm -hmm. And no less important either. Mm -hmm. We're talking about something that is as significant as Christ himself is. You, your souls, your ministries, your individual uh, paths before the Lord. Mm -hmm. yeah. Each one of these men sitting in front of me here, filled with the Holy Ghost, has just as an important of a ministry as Christ himself. And it's not an ego thing. It's not something we walk around with swollen egos over. But it is that significant. God sees you as exactly as important and significant as his own son, Jesus Christ. Isn't that something? <laughs> Isn't that great, Steve? Knowing that our lives are worth something, <laughs> more than just something, but absolutely vital to anybody that we come in contact with. Uh huh. Especially when those people that we contact get saved, get full of the Holy Ghost, and start going out there and ministering as well. We replicate ourselves that way. Mm -hmm. We replicate the Spirit of Christ and perpetuate it the way it needs to be done, not the way that man thinks it ought to be done. Because man's mind never got anything done. <clears throat> the very words of Jesus Christ and God the Father are what brought everything you see here into existence. The whole creation. The mind of man never really created much of anything. It can only try and hint at or substitute what God truly has. It never got anything done. You know, see what I mean? It was only the work of God that got anything accomplished. Mm -hmm. And we're just the vessels that he uses to do it. We're the instruments and we're the tools he uses to suit his purposes and to get his jobs done the various different jobs that he anoints us to do. Uh -huh. And it ha we have to have that anointing in order to be able to do it. Anybody out there without the Holy Ghost is wasting their time and wasting the name of God. They use the name of God. To say, well, we believe in, in, in the Lord and we take his name you know, and put it up on our church building. That's about it. You know, not much else to it. This is what the Holy Ghost does for you. Why were these folks speaking in tongues? Not because they were a bunch of religious idiots. This was, this initially was for a certain reason. Each one of these 120 uh, folks here started speaking in a tongue that they had not learned in order to catch other people that were around and listening to what was going on. And here's what happened. Let's, let's find out what happens. And I, I can explain a little bit more about tongues later. It's not, a, it's not some weird religious thing that we do. But it is for the, the converted Christian today. It is for you, and it, it, I'll, I'll just keep going about it. I can't stop. When you receive the gift of the Holy Spirit and this gift of tongues here, you're not going to be like one of these... Uh, odd, strange folks down in the south, one of these poison drinkers or snake handlers. Um, a lot of times with the, the uh, Pentecostal denominations, you find these people, they go around and they speak in tongues. It's a bunch of phony baloney. 
They do it when they get all worked up and they have their music blaring and they start dancing and jogging around and handling these snakes and drinking the poison and all that other stuff. That's not the best way to tempt the Lord thy God, I'll tell you that. That's not a good idea to do that. God can certainly heal you if somebody tries to poison you without you knowing. But to go and to uh, willingly test the Lord, not a good idea. This is what some people in some Pentecost bodies do. It's actually very anti-God. It's a substitute for what God really has. Okay? And they do it and they show it off. They show off with it. They show off with it when they do. It's not good. They do it in order to show off. We don't do that here. I'm not going to stand up in front of you guys and talk in tongues so that you can hear me talk in tongues. I know I can do it, and I know that I do do it to recharge my spirit. Because during these meetings, I give of my spirit, and I'm under the anointing to minister to you guys. And it takes that virtue to do it. And I'm glad to give it to you. I'm more than honored to do it for you. However, how do I recharge my battery then? How do I get full of the Holy Ghost? How do I keep that filling me and my cup running over? I speak in tongues and I recharge myself. And my spirit prays. My natural mind gets out of the way. See, when your spirit talks in a language that your natural mind has never learned, it keeps that natural mind out of God's way, out of your own soul's way, and you have a direct line to the Father. And no devils can intercept that communication. Mm -hmm. No other spirit can come in and jam that transmission. It's an awesome thing. And you, in the meantime, you get full. You stay full of the Holy Spirit by having that communion with directly between you and God the Father. You don't need a priest. You don't need a guy with a, a funny collar or a silly looking hat to do it for you. See what I'm saying? Yeah. You said this is really interesting to me. The way that I used to have heavenly Buddhism and chanting and stuff there. And that was sort of a replication of this. I never really Oh, yeah, that's an interesting take, yeah, and yeah. It was, a, it was a substitute for this that never really lasted and made a big impact. But this is actually exactly what I was looking for. Oh, fascinating. I was trying to follow that. That uh, was a way to clear channels and become straight, but it really wasn't. It was in this course of substitution. It was a mimicking of what that is. Yeah, okay, thank you. I'm going to repeat a couple of things here. Uh, for the sake of the recording. What Steve just said was, uh, and he makes a good point here, is that he uh, studied Buddhism and uh, different kinds of meditation and different kinds of chants and, and, and different things like that, looking to clear that channel to some higher divinity that he was looking to hear from and to communicate with, to open up those channels. But what he said was it's a substitute for what the Lord really does have for us. But there you go. I mean, if you want to look at it in, in a less religious term, because you've heard, and the mind of man and the media and the, the world today has taken something like speaking in tongues and turned it into an absolute abomination in their own minds. But it is for the believer today and it is for a reason, and it's not for the reasons that the world puts out there, and it's not some kind of negative uh, thing that's scary and, and creepy and weird. That's what the world likes to put out. That's what television shows and the media likes to put out. That's what the anti-God, anti-Christ spirits out there in the world like to put out, that this is some creepy, weird religious thing. It is not either. Not at all. So if you want to think of it as a better method than chanting during the meditations or opening up that channel to a higher source, this is the way to go directly to God the Father, right to the source. And you have that, you have that down payment of that source directly in you with the infilling of the Holy Ghost. You already have that. You already have that well in there. You just got to keep the well, you just got to keep the water washing in through there and keep it full. Keep the well full. Keep the pitcher full and running over. Keep the pitcher underneath the tap, that direct line that comes down, 
keep the pitcher underneath the tap and keep it running over. That's what speaking in an unknown tongue is. It's a gift of the Spirit. It's one of the best gifts you could ever receive from God. All you have to do is simply receive it. And he'll give it to you. <laughs> and when you start, all you have to do is just any syllable that comes to mind that's not in English or in any other language that you've ever learned, just simply repeat it. And it's going to sound maybe even silly to your natural mind. Get your own mind out of there. Let the mind of Christ come in and replace it. Mm -hmm. And don't feel embarrassed, don't feel funny, and don't let any kind of fear stop you. Fear not. <laughs> Once you do that, you'll start, you'll start giggling, <laughs> you'll start chuckling, you'll start feeling that joy. The Lord might even tickle you in the ribs a little bit just to let you know he's there. Go with it. Mm -hmm. This is what you can expect, guys, after getting baptized and full of the Holy Ghost for real. And I don't care how many times you've been baptized before. It probably wasn't by somebody that was full of the Holy Ghost. And if it was, that's fine. However, for my own, uh, <laughs> well, let's see, for my own consolation, let's say, I want you to start all over. It won't hurt you. It only takes about three minutes of your time. And that three minutes, you are able then to receive every good thing that God is just itching to give you guys. <laughs> it's amazing. It's amazing the amount of, of things and, and blessings and good things that God is just chomping at the bit to give to you if you'll just receive it. Just say, okay, Lord, I'll, I'll get everything that I can get from you. I want everything you've got. Don't hold back. <laughs> All right. Okay, here's one of the first reasons these, uh, God had these folks speak in tongues. They couldn't stop. They were so full of the Holy Ghost, it would just run right out of their mouths. Something had to happen here. And this is why. In verse 5, And there were, dwelling at Jerusalem, Jews, devout men, out of every nation under heaven. Now, the, the Jewish folks had spread all the way across the Roman Empire here. If you look at this map that I'm holding up, this was the known world at the time. <laughs> this little area here, the Roman Empire. All right? Here is, uh, here's Jerusalem and Judea, right there. There's Israel. Here's Syria. Italy over here in Rome. Macedonia, Greece, Galatia, the different places out over here. There were Jews living in all of these different places, all over the place. The Jewish religion had spread far and wide, okay? So this is what we're looking at. Uh, we even have Egypt down over here, and, you know, in northern Africa, okay? These were all cities with Ju um, Jewish communities in them. Every, every dot that you see on here had a Jewish community there somewhere, okay? So when you're talking about all kinds of cities that Paul went to, there were already Jews established there and everything, <laughs> as well as new Gentiles to, uh, to, to minister to as well. Okay? So that explains verse 5. Now, when this was noised abroad, the report went out about all this stuff. Hey, we got people over here talking all kinds of different languages. What's that all about? Let's go take a look at it, right? The multitude came together and were confounded. They were confused. <laughs> well, that was their problem. Confusion isn't part of the Spirit of God. Mm -hmm. The Word says, where, where you have bitter envying and strife in your hearts, there's confusion and every evil work. <laughs> so that's where the confusion comes from. It comes from being distracted by envying and being bitter and having huge festering arguments with other people. That's where the confusion comes from. That's where all these strange ideas come from. <laughs> all the weird stuff like, you don't need to be baptized anymore, or the Holy Ghost was just for the old apostles. All that confusing, wrong, negative stuff. I'm going to tell you something right now. It is a, indeed a fact that everything that's in this King James Version of the Bible is for you to have. It's for you to believe, and it's for you to obey it and to do it. Absolutely. 
There is nothing in here that you cannot have and that you cannot do. Mm -hmm. Except when in the Ten Commandments, God says, thou shalt not do this, thou shalt not do that. You will not do it. Mm -hmm. but once you're full of the Holy Ghost, I'll tell you what, you won't want to. Mm -hmm. He that is born of God doth not commit sin. For his seed, God's seed, which is the word, remains in him, and he cannot sin because he is born of God. He that sinneth is of the devil, for the devil sinneth from the beginning. That's how you know. See? Once you're baptized and full of the Holy Spirit, all your former sins are forgiven. It doesn't matter what you did five minutes ago. And I don't care what, you've ever, what you guys have ever done in your lives previous to this meeting tonight. I don't care. And I'm not here to condemn you for any of it. That's not my job. And I'm not concerned with that. I'm concerned that with God, you don't have a past. All you've got is a future now. And as many of, of you as would like to, I would like you guys to get baptized tomorrow at our meeting tomorrow. Uh, Steve knows where the location is. He knows the time and the place. It's at 2 o'clock, same place, same bat time, same bat channel, <laughs> okay? Uh, I want you to do it. It's for your own good. <laughs> Don't think about it too long. Just simply be obedient to it. It's the first step that you take towards Jesus Christ, mm -hmm. going under that water and getting that baptism. I was just going to say that, that this is important, just a tidbit. I, I've been studying religion for my whole life. I grew up in the Catholic Church. Um, I, had, I was with uh, Taoism and Buddhism for a long time. You know, since I was seven, I was in an Okinawan-based style of karate, beauty, you understand how that is, and some of you guys know, you know from the Korean-based styles. They force you into, or, or let you understand uh, the Taoism and Buddhism behind a lot of that stuff. And a lot of it's substitution. I've longed to try to figure out how I could have a better relationship with God in my life. I want to, you know, I have a happy life, and my life is one thing here on earth. My life beyond this is important to me. But I never had a great relationship with God. And, and God meaning inside of me, being clear, have, having clarity, which was my biggest issue. So when I finally met John, it was just a crazy coincidence that I happened to stumble through all of these insane roads to finally meet with John and, and all the people the ministry who uh, are instantly like my family. I mean, they've been just uh, the best people I've ever met in my life, period. And I've met a lot of people and I've been all around the world. Uh, these people are like my family and, and uh, getting here and getting and just turning my phones off and getting baptized and going through this whole thing has been the best thing that's ever happened to me. And, you know, they, they didn't have to help. No, none of them had to help me. It's, they, they got nothing out of it. You know, putting the time and every, all the energy aside, they got nothing from it. You know, they're just out putting their hand to help me out. And uh, when it happened for me, I went, you know, it was quick. And I really couldn't believe how fast it was. It was three minutes, two minutes yeah. in, out, done. And I was like, that's it. Expected a huge ceremony. You know, I'm from the Catholic Church. I thought we'd no. do, you know, there'd be like, you know, uh, some parade and we'd do fireworks or something. <laughs> but, uh, you know, it was just done. And, and uh I had spent a lot of time, and I've been spending a lot of time with John, finally understanding uh, the Word and really understanding what it was that uh, Jesus had, had done. Because I, I really didn't fully grasp all the things that He had done, and that, that all the, the real reason why He had done it. And it sort of was read to me a million times, and I had questions, and no one would answer them until now. But I didn't really get it, and, and I didn't really see the big picture. But uh, lately it's been crystal clear. and. I mean, I've never been happier, and I feel totally connected, and, and everything that I do now is just seamless and good. You know, I know that, that my decisions are kind of made for me, and not saying that I'm a robot, but I'm saying that I feel like I actually have help making some crucial decisions in my business, in my life, and uh, it's been the best thing that I could possibly ever ask for, and, uh, and you know, I just, I'm thankful that I made the decision to do it, and I'm, uh, you know, thankful that now I can understand uh, the word better and, and sort of, you know, makes sense to me now. And it's a weird thing. I, and just in finishing, I never thought that I would ever say uh, that I would be a totally practicing Christian because I, I, you know, believed everything that, that the world put into my head in terms of Christianity, you know, uh, I'm not, that's not me. You know, it's not me. I wanted to find God, but I didn't want to follow the rule book. I just wanted to do it my way. And uh, everything's come so clear now that I, I, 
sit down and everything. We, we've gone over just a chapter or two now, and uh, this is two chapters. I can see things left and right that make total sense to me. Uh, the way the government's run, the way that we look at ourselves and what we believe in and value inside and how we treat each other. It's all there over and over again to me now, and it wasn't there before. Yeah. And that's, uh, it's really interesting, but uh, it's the best thing that's happened. And if you guys want to partake in that, and I know that there's a few others that we're getting in, and, and this ministry is very large. I mean, there's only a couple guys here representing today, but yeah. there's a lot of friends and family here, and they're all good people. And if uh, the only thing I can tell you is uh, seriously consider it and don't let anybody talk to you about it, because they're going to tell you all the wrong things, and just like they, they tried to do for me. And it would have been the bad way if I, if I didn't take advantage for sure. Uh, and it was easy for me not to. Yeah. Yeah. So. Thank you, Steve, for that. Um, it's immensely helpful. The reason being, the reason it's so helpful is, um, here you, you've got a guy who's looking for answers all of his life and traveled the entire world looking for it. Nobody out there in the world give him any. None of them were full of the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost and the infilling of you with that Holy Spirit teaches you all things. That's what Steve was just hinting at. Now he has direction in his life. Now he knows his purpose in the universe and <laughs> the creation. Now he knows the difference between the world and the spirit. Absolutely the, the difference between right and wrong. Black or white, up or down, in or out, hot or cold. That's it. When so many people who profess to be Christians are sitting right on the fence, they're in the gray area, they're neither up nor down, neither on one side of the fence or the other, they don't know what they're doing. That's confusion. That's a dangerous place to be. It's in the book of Revelation, Jesus Christ said to a particular group of people, to a particular church, he said, I wish you were either hot or cold. But because you are lukewarm, I will vomit you out of my mouth. I will spew thee out of my mouth, he said. Mm -hmm. And the, the literal translation is vomit. I don't want to be considered vomit. I want to be hot. I'm, I'm on fire for the Lord. I'll just tell you straight out. You don't find a lot of professing Christians out there who are truly on fire. They want to go out and evangelize and push their little agenda, which is the mind of man's agenda. It has nothing to do with the will of God. There's a lot of philanthropy and feeding of the poor and stuff like that, and that's okay, that's great. But I'll tell you what. Jesus instructed his disciples, he says, you love one another. Those of you that have my spirit, don't go and cast your pearls out there before swine, lest they turn and rend you, tear you up or trample you under their feet. They'll, they'll trample the pearls under their feet and then turn and tear you up. Mm -mm. See, anything that's left over, you guys look out for one another. You all get filled with the Holy Ghost and you watch each other's backs and you help one another out. Then you'll begin to learn how to help others and to get them to start doing the same things. Do it the right way, not the world's way. And that's what Steve is hinting at. Uh, so many things that he said um, absolutely hit the bullseye because that's how the word works. And you know, without the infilling of the Holy Spirit, Steve would, or, or myself for that matter, I'll use myself as an example. If I didn't have the Holy Ghost, I wouldn't be able to be sitting here in front of you. I wouldn't be able to think of a thing to say. Because without that anointing, I'm just John, that's it. I'm just a dude without that anointing. And when that anointing lifts, I'm just a regular guy. Except I stay re recharged and I can get that anointing back every time, every single time. The Lord shows me exactly what to say, exactly what to do, and exactly where to be at a specific time. <laughs> he shows me, that Holy Spirit teaches me all things. What to do, when to do it, why, everything, and how. Most importantly, most professing Christians tell you, well, you gotta do this and you gotta follow all these rules that we made up, but they don't tell you actually how to serve God. It just, it just teaches you how to benefit their so-called ministry and to become part of their business organization. You see what I mean? There's a difference now between the professed Christian world out there 
and the actual true, real, spirit-filled saints and body of Christ in here. And I'm, I'm pointing into the, into the heart of man here. The kingdom of God is within man. It's not a building. It's not some so-called televangelist. It's not some so-called pastor or a guy who writes a bunch of books about a bunch of stuff and sells his stuff over a, a cable network. You see what I mean? Now, and as we go through this book of Acts, we're going to find out how the true church really operated. It's not like the world does it today. The world out there has it all wrong. And a lot of them aren't going to figure it out until it's too late. Oops. It's best to get it now before you miss your chance. And this is just other stuff. Okay. <clears throat> That doesn't, those pages didn't do me any good, so I just took them and chucked them. <laughs> All right. Now, so this is interesting. Verse 6, Now when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded, because that every man heard them speak in his own language. In other words, there were devout men from the Jewish faith that were living in different parts of the world and spoke these different languages as their own native language. They never did learn Hebrew or Aramaic at this point. If, they were, if these people were uh, Jews that were born in Rome, they would have been speaking uh, Latin. You see what I'm saying? And here, you had some of these Galilean folks here speaking in a language they'd never learned before. Maybe Latin, maybe um, Egyptian, maybe something else. And this is what was happening. This is great. Watch this. This was the way the Lord got his word out at first to peoples of different languages. Mm -hmm. And they were all amazed and marveled, saying one to another, Behold, are not all these which speak Galileans? In other words, these people from Galilee, how could they all know our different languages? They've, they haven't been abroad and they haven't learned these languages yet. They haven't been anywhere. They haven't traveled outside of their own area. You know, most of these people didn't go any further than maybe 40 to 100 miles outside of their, their little radius that they were able to, you know, to walk in or, or to go by horseback with or horse-drawn carriage. It's like the Old West. And how? How do we hear every man in our own tongue, our own language, wherein we were born? And here, here's some of the places they were from. Uh, Parthenians, Medes, and Elamites, and the dwellers in Mesopotamia and in Judea and Cappadocia, in Pontus and Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, in Egypt and in the parts of Libya about Cyrene and strangers of Rome, Jews and proselytes, Cretes and Arabians, we do hear them speak in our tongues the wonderful works of God. Isn't that fantastic? So in the beginning, not only was this benefit given to these uh, believers here, uh, this benefit of the Holy Ghost, the speaking in tongues for them to recharge and for them to edify themselves, to build themselves up. To edify means to build. If you build an edifice, you're building a building. To build themselves up, but also to get the word out to these other languages. Guess why? So the entire known world here would have no excuse that they weren't uh, given access to the Word of God during that time. Mm -hmm. And now, you can read probably any version of the Bible you want to over the internet for free anyhow. So, I tell you, this globe is still without excuse. Mm -hmm. They have no reason to say, well, we, we didn't have access to it. And these folks here, by this time, by the time these words came out of their mouths, <laughs> no pun intended. They were without any excuse. We hear all these guys in all our own languages speaking the wonderful works of God. Mm -hmm. And now, in verse 12, the wrong spirit's going to come in. I'm going to identify it. It's called a spirit of doubt. That's right. Faith and doubt don't mix. Mm -mm. Here's what happened. And they were all amazed and were in doubt. Or literally here, uh, perplexed. 
<laughs> well, that's the wrong spirit. That's not a spirit of God. Being perplexed isn't a, isn't a condition God wants his men in. Seriously. Saying one to another, what meaneth this? Well, what does this mean? Well, I hope they got it figured out. And in verse 13 here, another wrong spirit. I'll tell you something. The word says God is not mocked. Verse 13, others mocking said, these men are full of new wine. <laughs> you know what? In one sense, they were right. In the other sense, they were wrong, dead wrong. <laughs> this is an interesting good one right here. <laughs> this is great. These men are full of new wine. In other words, um, these guys have been drinking the new stuff. They've been drinking the, uh, the, the cheap stuff, it hasn't been aged. It's full of alcohol and, and, and also other kinds, of, uh, other kinds of toxins the age hasn't taken out yet. These men are full of new wine. They're drunk. But Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice and said unto them, You men of Judea and all you that dwell at Jerusalem, be this known unto you and hearken to my words. You, why don't you listen to me for a change? Here, now, Peter had some authority. Finally, because Peter had gotten full of the Holy Ghost back here. Now, we're listening to the words of a converted Peter. <laughs> For these are not drunken, as you suppose. See, this is coming out of your own mind. Mm -hmm. Seeing it is but the third hour of the day. Yeah, it's not cocktail hour. It's not happy hour yet. Right, guys? <laughs> Let me tell you something, though. Back here in verse 13, this is an interesting pun because Jesus Christ is the new wine. Mm -hmm. no, Jesus Christ himself told the religious leaders of his day, and he was talking about them. This is very interesting and fascinating. He was talking about them and their old religion that had gotten oppressive and problematic. He said, No man, after having drunk the old wine, desireth the new for they say, the old is better. Those religious leaders of Jesus' day, the scribes and the Pharisees that we'll talk about later and in the Gospels that you'll hear about on some of these recordings, those religious leaders were the old bottles. He said, you can't put new wine into old bottles. Another way of saying it is you can't teach an old dog new tricks, right? Mm -hmm. Those old scribes and Pharisees, the religious leaders, and they were religious leaders and the political leaders all rolled up in one. What a nightmare. Can you imagine if our government today was um, like the Vatican or something? Where not only we had politicians, but they were religious as all get out? Wouldn't that just be maddening and sickening all at the same time? Can you imagine that? If we had a Vatican-style government? You won't do this, and you won't do that, and you're not free to listen to this music and all this other garbage. It's like just really just rules and regulations up the yin-yang. This is what these guys back in the, in the days of Jesus and these early apostles here, these disciples, that's exactly what it was like. They were the religious and political leaders of their day. And then the Romans would supervise them in, in a, a constitutional way. They, the Romans left the Jews to worship the way they wanted, but they were still under that Roman rule and under occupation. And so they were still under that supervision, and they hated that. Well, they didn't want to serve God in the first place. The Jews didn't. So the, the Lord just let the Romans overrun them. Mm -hmm. And it's like I said earlier, any time that the, the Jews did not want to serve God or were disobedient to God and, and wanted to serve other things, he'd just let some other heathen nation come in and overrun them. So, well, you don't want to serve me, you go and serve their gods then. But I'm not happy with you. And I guess what? You're not going to have it good until you, until you get back to me. That's what God would tell them. He would send men of God to tell them and everything. And sometimes they'd listen, they'd do fine for a while, and they'd keep going back. So God got tired of this back and forth game. Are they going to obey me or not? He sent his son, Jesus Christ, to give us the Holy Spirit in a nutshell, to be able to overcome sin in the flesh, and to be able to be obedient to him, to obey 
is better than sacrifice. In other words, just do what's right the first time instead of go and sin and then have to repent and then sin and repent and sin and repent and sin and repent. What do they do in the Catholic Church now? That's what they do. Bless me, Father, for I have sinned. God doesn't bless sinners. See? Every time the Jews, the children of Israel, it's all in the Word. Every time they sinned, He didn't bless them. He cursed them. He sent a curse onto them. He'd send them a plague and just kill a bunch of them. Anytime they rebelled or disobedient or exceedingly sinful, he would wipe them out or put them under heavy bondage. Mm -hmm. And that's what churches today, religious organizations have been doing. All this traditional religion and religious traditional stuff is old hat now. They keep you under that so that they can control you. <laughs> Nobody can control an overcomer because that's what an overcomer does. He overcomes everything that's holding him back and trying to control him. The only thing that should be controlling us is the Spirit of Jesus Christ. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, the Word says, there is liberty. There isn't any other liberty aside from where the Spirit of the Lord is. That's the way I look at it. Uh-huh. You're free to serve God or serve the devil. You choose which one you want. Mm -hmm. Here's another fascinating fact as well. The word says, even the devils believe and tremble. Oh, they believe and tremble and appear in churches. Mm -hmm. Back in the book of Luke, there was a guy with an unclean devil in the synagogue, in the church of their day, crying out against Jesus. Uh-huh, church people. And the church people were the ones that conspired against him to kill him off. Jesus was the most unreligious figure in history. He was against old-time religion. He was against those old rules and regulations and came to give us one new one. Love one another as I have loved you and serve the Lord with all your heart, mind, body, soul, and spirit, with all your strength, and then your neighbor, the fellow saints, as yourself. The apostle John also said, if you will just love one another, you'll fulfill all the law the Old Testament rules and regulations, all the sacrifices and everything, and the prophets, everything that the old men of God instructed, you'll automatically do it. If you're full of the Holy Spirit, you'll automatically do everything God wants you to do without much difficulty. <laughs> mm -hmm. I'll be straight up and honest with you guys. The only difficulty that you will experience is maybe the enemy will come against you after you're baptized because the enemy does not want you to be full of the Spirit of God. He wants you to be full of all the wrong spirits and serve Him. So choose you this day whom you will serve. As for me and my house, I will serve the Lord. That's me. So you can use me as a good example of what to do. Let's move on. These men are full of new wine. Well, Jesus is that new wine. So in a way, they were right. <laughs> but these folks here that didn't have the Holy Spirit were thinking with their natural mind. Peter, on the other hand, is thinking by the Spirit. See, this is how this works. So in a way they were right, in a way they were wrong, which makes it an interesting and funny pun, <laughs> whether intentional or unintentional. <laughs> but Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice and said unto them, You men of Judea and all you that dwell at Jerusalem, be this known unto you and hearken to my words. Yeah, I've got some authority now. Why did he have authority? He had the same authority Christ had because he was full of the spirit of Christ. It's great. He had the mind of Christ now. These are not drunken, as you suppose, seeing it is but the third hour of the day. But this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. He says, I'll tell you what it is. There was a prophet back there named Joel, and this is what we're experiencing now. This is what Joel said. And here, finally, Peter quoted a scripture from the Old Testament. How? By the Holy Ghost. Through the anointing of the Holy Spirit, Peter was able to quote from the Old Testament scriptures, which he wasn't <laughs> particularly well versed in before. You'd hardly ever heard him say anything about it. In fact, we could probably go back and look, and you didn't see Peter quoting many scriptures, especially by the Spirit, <laughs> before this day. Now it just comes flooding out. This is what Joel said, And it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh. 
Mm -hmm. And whether you receive that spirit or not is up to you. If you, want to, if you want to walk in the spirit, you can do that. If you want to stay in the flesh, you're free to do so. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. What's that? Anybody in a religious church, uh, you guys here, those of you who I've just met tonight, could I get a show of hands? How many have ever told you that you can prophesy? No hands. I pretty much thought that was the case. What's prophecy? <laughs> Somebody that's full of the Holy Ghost will prophesy. And it's the mind of Christ speaking through you. It's a tool that God uses. You become a prophet. Mm -hmm. Do you guys know that you get to be prophets? <laughs> you get to be according to your faith and according to your anointing and the dispensation that God gives you according to your individuality, according to your personalities as individuals. God gives you the opportunity to be uh, an apostle, a prophet, an evangelist, a pastor, or a teacher. Once you're well-versed and well-seasoned in the word. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. These men here that have the Holy Spirit can do any one of those things, given the proper anointing. Mm -hmm. I've heard these men speak the Word of God. It's called the, the gift of prophecy, and that's also another manifestation of the Holy Spirit. And this is what Joel, an old prophet of God from the Old Testament, prophesied for in the future. Let's see what else he says. He says, your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Oh, the men and women can both enjoy these gifts. Why in some religions do you have the men over on one side of the room and the women are over on the other side and there's a segregation? That's unnecessary. And Joel here gets rid of the uh, male-female problem. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because in, in God's realm, in the spiritual realm that's beyond this world. You're neither uh, male nor female. You're neither uh, married nor given in marriage. There's no, there's no gender up there. Mm -hmm. Okay, your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions. You'll get vision and revelation by the Spirit of Jesus Christ. These are all the kinds of things you can expect after being baptized and filled with the Holy Ghost. And your old men shall dream dreams. Mm -hmm. You'll have... Uh, Revelation in the night watches as you're sleeping. And on my servants and on my handmaidens. See, there's God is specific. God's servants and God's handmaidens. God's men and women. Men and women of God get to do this. No other religious idiot out there gets to do this. <laughs> First of all, they don't have any mind in them because they don't have the mind of Christ. And they're religious because they're only taking the Lord's name. In vain, for no reason. They're wasting their time. See, that's really taking the name of God in vain, is using his name for the benefit of a natural man, uh, you know, to do business contacts or to have friends or to have somewhere to go on Sunday. Just an excuse to do something else other than sit around and completely waste a bunch of time. See what I'm saying? You might as well uh, play video games or something. You know, if you want to waste time, there's all kinds of things you can do. And I don't have to go into them because <laughs> the list is a mile long and it's a day late and a dollar short already. So what we got here is, I will pour out in those days of my spirit, that's the Holy Ghost, and they shall prophesy. Yeah. They, they will give the mind of God, thus saith the Lord unto my son Steve, thus and so. That's how it goes. Mm -hmm. And I will show wonders in heaven above and signs in the earth beneath blood and fire and vapor of smoke. You know, after you get baptized, you're going to see by the Spirit some of these things too. You're going to have things come against you. But that'll be just the, uh, the proof that you need that you did receive the Holy Ghost and that the devil is pissed off at you for getting it. <laughs> That's fine too. <laughs> okay, well, there'll be all this other stuff going on. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood 
before that great and notable day of the Lord come. And in a way, he's talking about, you know, that last, when Jesus comes back to get us all for the last time during the rapture. And then the rest of this is all burnt up, okay? And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Mm -hmm. Mark 16, 16 also says this, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. That sounds pretty final. So it, what it really does is it really draws that line, you know, okay, this is the way it is. Either take it or leave it. And it, it's really, it's very easy to just simply receive it. That's the way I look at it. All you, all you got to do is just simply just say, okay, I'll, I'll take that. <laughs> the Lord is passing around a huge plate of jewels, gold, bullion, and all, diamonds, all kinds of great stuff. And there are people out there, that, oh, no thanks, I don't want any of that. <laughs> what makes them any smarter then? <laughs> See what I'm saying? All you have to do is just, yeah, I'll take the whole plate. <laughs> Except I won't be greedy, I'll let everybody else take one. But I'll take, the, I'll take the entire plate if you guys don't want it. See what I'm saying? You know, I want everything God's got for me. And he, he promises it to you. It's a new and better testament based on better promises than what the people of the Old Testament had. I'll just keep rambling on here. How about that? You know what the difference between the Old Testament and the New Testament is? The Old Testament is Christ, but he's concealed. He's hidden away. The New Testament is Christ revealed. Plainly to us, plain as day. Yeah. And when you get full of his spirit, he reveals all things to you out of his word. The word suddenly makes a lot more sense than it did before. And you start making the connections. Those neurons and synapses start firing in your brain. Mm -hmm. It's quite the mind-expanding experience. It really is. It truly is. It's amazing. And I don't have words to describe it. It's that good. Uh, and... When the Lord anoints you to minister people, he will show you things on the spot like he does me. And I can use myself as an example. There isn't anything more fun for me than what I'm doing right now. Because it gives you guys the opportunity to do the same thing and to feel what I'm feeling. See? To be full of that spirit and to have it just out of your belly will flow rivers of living water, the word says. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, let's move on and see what else uh, Peter says here. In verse 22, he says, You men of Israel, anyone in the church, <laughs> hear these words. Really hear it. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs, which God did by him in the midst of you. In, right in the middle of your town, he's saying. As you yourselves also know, he said, you've seen it, and don't try and deny it either. Because Jesus' ministry was full-blown. During the three and a half years he was ministering, he went from one side of Israel to the other, from the top to the bottom. He went everywhere there was to go and did the best that he could with what he had. And these people here listening to what Peter is saying now, didn't have any excuses to not know what had been going on. It was quite the thing. It was quite spectacular. It was also quite controversial. Everything. <laughs> What's amazing, though, is the controversy didn't come from Jesus. It came from all the guys who wanted to keep Jesus down and to keep his followers down and to keep anyone from being healed on the Sabbath day. He just told them, look, what, what's easier to do? Is it better to do uh, good on the Sabbath day or to do evil? What the hell's the matter with you guys, in other words? <laughs> Would you rather sit, have me sit on my hands and do nothing? No. I work today, I work tomorrow, and on the third day, I shall be perfected. Mm -hmm. That's what he told them. He says, I'm going to keep doing regardless of what you guys want me to do. <laughs> Jesus was in a way, a rebel against everything that was holding people back and oppressing them. Because those religious leaders of Jesus' day were oppressing the people. There, were, there was sin, sickness, and disease right in their synagogues because those, those so-called um, religious leaders weren't 
healing the people. They weren't doing the jobs that God had originally outlined for them to do. They were not doing it. So Jesus just told them all, well, I'll replace you then. And that's why they wanted to kill him, because their livelihood and their great jobs were at jeopardy, and their big salaries that they enjoyed, and their great uh, fame that they enjoyed, and the, 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 the so-called honor and respect that they received from the people. Yeah, a downtrodden people that they had oppressed and beaten into submission to them, and not to God anymore. Mm -hmm. Jesus told him, he says, you teach for doctrine the commandments of men. What happened to the commandments of God? They went straight out the window and they started preaching their own minds to the people. You know, it's something. They became dictators mm -hmm. and enslaved the people. And Jesus was here to free the captives and to bring people out of bondage. You get rid of the sin. Here's another good point. Jesus told people, he said, look, go and sin no more. Lest a worse thing come upon thee. He told one particular man that. He also told a particular woman the same thing for a reason. Number one, it was possible to go and sin no more. Otherwise, why would Jesus tell somebody that they could go and do that? And second, it was to show them, go and sin no more, lest a worse thing come upon you. In other words, this thing that you're suffering from now and that you just got delivered from now was brought on by your sin. Now, if you'll go and sin no more, then you'll get rid of the sin, the sickness, and the disease. You get rid of the sin, you get rid of the sickness and disease, too. It's true. Uh-huh. If you're saved, you're healed. <laughs> People are big into healing today. <laughs> All they'd have to do is just get saved, they'd be healed. Sure. Believing. No doubt in there. <laughs> Anybody could be healed of anything. You get rid of the doubt, you get rid of the sin, you get rid of the sickness and the disease. Not only the physical sickness and disease, but the mental and spiritual sickness and disease. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. Yeah. They got tablets and prescriptions and medication to get rid of mental illness. If those people would just get rid of their sin, they'd get rid of the sickness and disease, the mental stuff, too. It's true. Mm-hmm. Jesus would go and cast the devils out of persons that were, by our modern day terms, mentally ill, severely, like uh, 5150s, criminally insane, guys who were uh, uh, the equivalent of uh, somebody that's uh, just out of his head on PCP, things like that, guys with superhuman strength, everything. They try to shackle them down back here and they just break the shackles. No different today. You got guys that are demon possessed out there, whacked out on something, and the, and the demons give them uh, superhuman strength. Yep, the first thing you do, even to heal somebody, and uh, I, I didn't put two and two together for the longest time, but I finally figured it out. You get rid of the sin, you get rid of the sickness and disease. Even to heal someone, he would just tell them, your sins are forgiven. And if he would forgive their sins, then the sickness and disease would leave too and they'd be healed. That's how it worked. It was great. Jesus could always do the greatest things very simply, and yet it was so hard for the mind of man to figure it out. That's why you've got to get that uh, infilling of the Holy Ghost in order to be able to figure these things out. Otherwise, you'll be, in, you'll be stumbling around in the dark the rest of your lives. Lots of luck to you, because luck will be all you have. I certainly won't have the Spirit to back you up. When you do have the Spirit to back you up, God backs up everything you say and do, as long as it lines up with His Word. And it's very easy when you do it right. It's a lot easier to serve God than it is to serve the devils in the world out there. You can't serve God and mammon. Mammon being the spirit of this world and the, the rudiments and the, the exercises and the, 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 um, the bondage that this world is under. Okay, let's finish off this chapter, and then I think we can wind this down. All right, we are in verse 22. Okay, as you yourselves also know. He's telling them, you know about this already, and don't try to deny it either. <laughs> Him, Jesus Christ, being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, 
you have taken and by wicked hands crucified and slain. Mm -hmm. Lawless hands being another uh, literal translation of the word here. In this Bible that I have, it has literal translations for a lot of words that aren't uh, exactly apparent immediately. So it gives a literal translation as to what the words say. There's also another book that you can get. It's called A Strong's Exhaustive Concordance of the Bible. And the reason that there exists a concordance of the Bible is because words are spirits. Mm -hmm. Wicked here means a wicked spirit, or by wicked hands, or by lawlessness. That disobedient spirit goes along with wicked. Mm -hmm. Somebody that's wicked is very, very disobedient against God and stubborn against God. And stubbornness is a bad, bad spirit. See, words are spirits. Well, when you get a concordance, it tells you what spirit is back behind every single word in here. And if you look up a word, like, say, like love, which is a good spirit, or joy, which is one of the good spirits of God, it gives you all the other spirits behind it that go along with it. Or if you have a wicked thing in there, such as frowardness or stubbornness, you can look up stubborn in a concordance, and it will give you all of the finer shades of meaning to those words and give you insight into those kinds of different spirits. It's a neat thing to have. Mm -hmm. Okay, so he says, you've taken him and by wicked hands have crucified and slain whom God has raised up, having loosed the pains of death. <laughs> God can unloose the chains of death, literally. And it's not just your death of the body that you see here, this flesh and blood. The second death is the death of your soul. And the death of your soul is equal to eternal separation from the presence of God. See, that's not where you want to be. You may not be down all the way into the pit where the flames are or the lake of fire, but you won't be in glory, that, which is above all the heavens, either. You'll be somewhere in the middle, and you won't be satisfied knowing that you didn't make it all the way to glory, which is where you want to go. I want to make another point. The Word says that Jesus ascended up far above all heavens. Still want to go to heaven? I don't. But you've never heard this before. And if you have, you're pretty sharp. <laughs> I'll tell you what. Glory is a place. And the Word gives us hints. In the Word, even in Psalms, David said, His glory is above the heavens. Another place also says, uh, His glory is above heaven and earth. See? Glory is a place where you want to go. You don't want to go into heaven. Heaven is a, a, a lesser habitation than glory. Glory is where the throne is, where God the Father and Jesus Christ have the throne. Jesus said to his disciples, he said, in my Father's house are many mansions, many different habitations to live in. Mm -hmm. and, he, and he said, uh, I go to prepare a place for you, something that's higher than the heavens. And that where I am, Jesus told him, he said, look, you guys, where I'm going, I want you to, there, to be there also. Where, that where I am, you may be also. So knowing this word, cover to cover, is of utmost importance because it gives you all the information you need to know exactly where you need to go. You need to go beyond heaven into glory. You need to be concentrating on the throne. Glory is a place, it's like the king of all the heavens, if you want to think of it that way. It's the ultimate. It's the, it's the absolute most excellent glory is what, it, what it's called. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times when Jesus used the word heaven, you'll find that it was before his uh, crucifixion and resurrection and ascension and when he uses the word heaven, it's a, like a measurement of time and space, or it's a measurement of the limitless um, 
spiritual realms, you know, maybe the different dimensions, the different levels of vibration, you know? Your, your body can't inhabit any more than three or four dimensions, I guess, that I know of, but your spirit can occupy those fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, and ninth, nth degree dimensions. You see what I'm saying? Those different habitations, those different levels that God has. God has different places for different souls. And he puts them wherever he chooses. Really n none of our business where they go. However, what is my business is, I know I'm going to glory. Because the word says it can be attainable. That's a whole other study. But I want to get you guys acquainted with some of the good things, some of the best good things that God has for you tonight. While I have this opportunity, I have you sitting in front of me here. Because the world out there and the religious organizations out there aren't going to give it to you. They want you to only get an inch off the ground. That's it. You stay right here under our thumb. No, with God, all things are possible. You just remember that. All things are possible for you. There are no, we're not here to limit you. We're here to set you free from anything that would be holding you back from getting to know God on a personal level. Mm -hmm. between you and him. You guys get to have a personal relationship with God. And Jesus is the only high priest that you need. You don't need any other dude in the flesh. Uh -huh. You got an issue with him, you just confess to him. Right to the Lord himself. And you change your mind. To repent means you just change your mind. What do you do? You take the, the natural mind, the mind of man, that goes away, that dies out. That gets crucified with the affections and the lusts and all the wrong things, and you switch that out for the mind of Christ. <laughs> yeah, it's like switching out a bad transmission for a good transmission. Mm -hmm. The transmission, the bad one that you had, you're trying to drive, but you, the motor's running, but there's, there's nothing to drive the rear axle. It's all screwed up in there, and all the gears are cracked and worn out. There's no fluid in there. There's no Holy Spirit in there. There's no transmission fluid to make it all run. You put that good transmission in there, you're going. See what I'm saying? You're gonna, and here's the word. You're going to have lots of gas, and you're going to have lots of road to go down. It's going to be a straight and narrow road. There's not going to be much of anything that can get in your way either, especially you keep honking that horn loud enough. Yeah. Blow that trumpet. Let's get through this chapter, because this is all good stuff here. Mm -hmm. Okay, he loosed the pains of death, and that's what the Lord's going to do for you guys. Because it was not possible that he should be holding of it. Mm -hmm. He's not going to be held down by it, in other words. Jesus Christ is not held down by any limitations at all. <laughs> so, therefore, it stands to reason when you're full of his spirit, there's nothing that can limit you either. It's true. Do I speak the truth, fellas? Yeah. Yeah. For David speaketh concerning him, I foresaw the Lord always before my face, for he is on my right hand that I should not be moved. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to be shaken. Mm -hmm. Therefore did my heart rejoice and my tongue was glad. Moreover, also my flesh shall rest in hope. That's the only way you can get peace. And that's what so many people are out after right now, too. Just to have a little peace in their lives. I'll tell you what. That infilling of the Holy Spirit brings peace that passes all understanding. The peace that is so good you can't even comprehend <laughs> the, the, uh, the greatness of it. <laughs> that's good. I'd rather have too much peace than not enough. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Therefore did my heart rejoice, my tongue was glad. Moreover, also my flesh shall rest in hope, because thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Jesus went down into the grave for about three days, and that wasn't long enough for his body to completely be corrupted, in other words. Same with us, spiritually or physically. When that holy one, Jesus Christ, is in you, you will not see corruption. Your mind will not be corrupted, your soul will not be corrupted, and your body will be healed. Mm -hmm. And continue to be continually resurrected. 
you'll have your little aches and pains here and there. But for the most part, you'll be absolutely perfect, complete, and whole. The other thing that I want to stress tonight is perfection. Nobody's perfect. That's a lie of the devil. Perfect means, in a biblical sense, integrity, truth, without blemish, complete, full, without spot, and undefiled. Mm -hmm. Full and complete. Perfect and sincere. You have a perfect heart toward God. You're never going to live up to the natural man's idea of what perfection is. Well, you'll never utter a curse word, and you'll never um, smell bad, and you'll never uh, get in a traffic accident. That's man's idea of perfection. Well, that goes straight out the window. Do you know the word perfect in any of its forms, a lot of different forms it takes on, in the word is mentioned 128 times, and yet the religious churches will not teach you this. They'll teach you that you're always going to be a sinner and that you'll never be perfect. That is a lie of the devil. Remember, I told you before, even devils so-called believe and tremble. They know the Lord and they tremble at his presence. And they also go to churches. And some of them are pastors of churches. I call them religious spirits. It's a wrong spirit. It's a substitute for the Holy Spirit of God. Starting to understand, starting to clue in here. Jesus in Matthew 5.48 told him, Be you perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. Now, if it wasn't possible to do, why would Jesus command it? We are commanded to be perfect. The Bible teaches that it is not only possible, but that God expects us to attain a standard of perfection in our daily walk in the Spirit of the Lord. Mm Mm-hmm. Galatians 5.22 through 25 says this, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, self-control. Against such, there is no law. There's no law against any of those good things. <laughs> That's great. There's nothing man, that man can legislate against in any of this stuff. They can try all they want. They can't stop us from living out these things here. And they that are Christ's have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Yeah, consider your old flesh and your old sins and your old man dead and gone once you've gone under those waters. Yeah, Matthew 5.48, I quoted that. Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. That's the words of Jesus Christ. I dare anyone to go up against that and try to negate it, try to get rid of it and try to dispute that and try to argue that. That's the words of Christ. You either believe the words of Christ or you don't. Mm -hmm. And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly or fully. And I pray, God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless. That's perfection. Unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Sanctify means separation of the believer from evil things and ways. Holy is complete, blameless, is guiltless, no spot, no blemish. Mm -hmm. Um, Here are some examples that can be found of perfect men. Genesis 6, 9. These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just man and perfect in his generations, and Noah walked with God. This is the word now. Don't let any devil try to convince you that you can never be perfect and that you can never overcome uh, your sinful nature, they say. Don't let them talk you out of your salvation. Mm -hmm. This perfection is part of your salvation. This perfection is what what makes you a saint. That S of saint, salvation. The A, authority. The I, integrity, perfection. Mm -hmm. The N, newness of life, that resurrection power that Jesus gives you. And T, your testimony. Mm -hmm. That's right. (laughs) Lord showed me that. I woke up with it one morning. These are just some of the interesting things that the Lord can show you. And that's just scratching the surface. Okay, uh, let's see. 
Abraham, Genesis 17, 1. And when Abram was 90 years old and nine, the Lord appeared to Abram and said unto him, I am the almighty God. Walk before me and be thou perfect. You do it. All you have to do is determine within yourself that you can do it and that you just will do it. Just receive perfection. Just accept that you are perfect. God created each and every one of you in your mother's womb. And God did not create anything that was impure or imperfect. Mm -hmm. Jesus is the light of the world. And if that light is in you, well, then let there be light. Let there be light. Let the light bulbs come on. It's the light's turning on now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And God saw the light, that it was what? Imperfect? Mm -mm. God saw the light, and he saw that it was very good. God didn't make anything that was imperfect to begin with. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the only things that defiled men were the things that came out of their mouths. Mm -hmm. There is nothing about God that denies you anything, especially perfection, holiness, those good things. Mm -hmm. God commanded Abraham to have a perfect walk before him. Mm -hmm. God just told him, be you perfect. Mm -hmm. And Jesus repeated it all over the place. Job 1.1. 1, 1. There was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job, and that man was perfect and upright, and one that feared God and eschewed or rejected evil. This is the word talking. Mm -hmm. 1 Kings 15, 14. Asa's heart was perfect with the Lord all his days. Deuteronomy 18, 13. This is a commandment of God. Thou shalt be perfect with the Lord thy God. <laughs> I challenge any devil to try and dispute with that with me tonight. Look what I'm holding this. I'm holding an entire study on perfection. These are also available too. Uh, now in CD form, you can slam it into your computer and look up any of this stuff now. I'm going to give you guys some really great tools so that you can learn extremely quickly the good things of God. Not any of this other garbage out there and this confusing stuff anymore. You get right to the nitty gritty and get what the Lord has for you right now. There's no time to waste now. Mm -hmm. Deuteronomy 32 4. He is the rock. That's the rock, Christ Jesus. His work is perfect. For all his ways are judgment, a God of truth and without iniquity. Just and right is he. Mm hmm. Look at this. Romans 9.21 says this. Has not the potter power over the clay yeah, of the same lump to make one vessel unto honor and another unto dishonor? Mm -hmm. They're both different types of people, too. We are the clay. God's perfect work. For God's work is perfect. His salvation is perfect. Mm -hmm. There's another lie that goes out that says, well, Everyone on this planet is a child of God. That's also a lie of the devil. In John, it says, he gave us power to become the sons of God. Now, if we were already sons of God, then he would not have to even give us any power to have to become anything, right? It also says, in 1 John, I believe it is, that says that it's evident that there's a difference between the children of God and the children of the devil. It's all right there in the Word. So you've got to know this Word to be able to sort out all the crap that goes out in religious uh, circles and are out of religious mouths and out of religious minds. It's called a religious spirit. It looks religious. It acts religious. It takes a form of religion. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's, the Word says that they have a form of godliness but deny the power thereof. Uh -huh. They take the name and they use it for whatever they're doing, but really, 
they deny the power in it. And they don't use or take on that power. It takes some responsibility in order to do that. Mm -hmm. 1 John 1, 7, but if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin, all. Mm -hmm. First Kings eight sixty one. this is even Old Testament stuff. And I'm just brief, briefly skimming some of these. Uh, let your heart therefore be perfect with the Lord our God to walk in his statutes and to keep his commandments as at this day. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's not changeable. Proverbs 2.21, for the upright shall dwell in the land and the perfect shall remain in it. Not the sinner. Mm -hmm. You want the inheritance of God. Be upright and perfect. Those are the ones that get it. It doesn't say the sinner and the ungodly will get anything. No. There's pages and pages of perfection in here. See that? These are all scriptures that have been cited and put into a, a, another thing. If you want to study out perfection, look at uh, Paul's teaching in the book of Hebrews in the New Testament. It mentions perfection a lot. In fact, I can just cite a few here. How about Luke 6.40? The disciple is not above his master, but everyone that is perfect shall be as his master. Uh -huh. If you're perfect, you'll be like Jesus Christ, your master. Uh -huh. John 17.23 I in them, and thou in me, that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that thou hast sent me, and hast loved them as thou hast loved me. Mm-hmm. Jesus' wish was that we be made perfect. Paul talks about it in 1 Corinthians 2, 6 and 7. Howbeit we speak wisdom among them that are perfect, yet not the wisdom of the world, nor of the princes of this world that come to naught or come to nothing. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom, which God ordained before the world unto our glory. There's that word glory again. 2 Corinthians, Paul says this, finally, brethren, he was talking to living people here, I would imagine. Not dead ones or, or dead saints voted in after they're dead. It doesn't make much sense to talk to them. Finally, brethren, farewell. Be perfect. Just decide that you're going to be perfect. Be of good comfort. Be of one mind, live in peace, and the God of love and peace shall be with you. He didn't say, go out and sin and repent and then sin and repent and then bang your head against that sinful wall and keep repenting and keep, you know, your head bloodied, bruised and bashed in and have the, you know, foggy brains all the time, not knowing what you're doing, running around with your head smashed in all the time. No. He said, if you'll, if you'll be perfect, then you'll be of good comfort, then you'll be of one mind, then you'll be able to live in peace, and then the God of love and peace shall be with you. See what I'm saying? Does this make sense? Yeah, these are the steps you've got to take in order to, to walk it right before God. Philippians 3.15 says, Let us therefore, as many as be perfect, be thus minded. Have that mind of Christ. And if in anything you be otherwise minded, God shall reveal even this unto you. If there's anything getting in there that's, that's bugging you, God will reveal to you what it is, and he'll help you straighten it out. He's there to help you, not to hinder you. Not to beat you down and tell you that you can't be perfect, and that you can't overcome sin, and that you can't do this, and you can't do that. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Yeah. To get you freed up enough to actually do the true will of God. Not the ideas of what man thinks you ought to do to be able to serve God. Those are two completely opposite things. Uh-huh. First John 5.18, we know that whosoever is born of God sinneth not. That born again experience. When you come up out of that water, you are a new creature. That's being like being born again. That's your born again experience. A lot of people use that term real loosely and don't even know what they're talking about. 
We know that whosoever is born of God sinneth not. But he that is begotten of God keepeth himself, and that wicked one toucheth him not. The devil can't even touch you if you keep yourself perfect. Hebrews 6.1, this is a doozy. Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, those beginning things, you repented, you got baptized, you get to move on. He says, let us go on unto what? Sinfulness? No. Let us go on unto what? Mediocrity? No. It's not what it says. Let us go on unto perfection. Not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God. See? Not sinning and repenting, sinning and repenting. See what I mean? The scriptures back up perfection and sinlessness to the hilt. It's just that nobody's out there teaching this anymore. It's time to get these scriptures back into people's hearts and minds, folks. And the time is right now. And this is all good. Uh, Hebrews 9 11 through 14, but Christ being come an high priest, the only one that you need, of good things to come. <laughs> and you expect those good things, by the way, by a greater and more perfect tabernacle. That's you. And the Spirit of Christ is in you. You are the temple of God. Some of you have heard that, You're, that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, the temple of, of the Lord. Okay? A more perfect tabernacle. He's going to make you more perfect than you already are. Yeah. I don't look at you guys the way you were five minutes ago. I'm, I'm looking at you guys now the way you're going to be five years from now. If you be obedient to what the Lord prescribes for you this night. Okay? Um, perfect and more perfect. <laughs> uh-huh. Not made with hands. That is to say, not of this building. It's not some church organization somewhere. Neither by the blood of goats and calves. The, the stuff they used to sacrifice for their sins back there. I'll tell you what. It's all back behind you. Mm -hmm. Why? Jesus said this. No man, having put his hand to the plow and looking back, is fit for the kingdom of God. You've got to keep your eyes out ahead, straight ahead. Looking back, the furrow's not going to go straight. That's not going to work. You can't grow a crop with crooked furrows. You don't know where to put the seeds. You don't know where to water. You don't know what, what's going on. There's confusion. See, it's got to be straight. It's got to be lined out perfectly. But by his own blood, he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. He made that last sacrifice for the rest of eternity. Those people didn't have to make those bulls and goats and, and blood sacrifices anymore. All that hard stuff of the Old Testament. The difficult stuff. The bloody and messy and probably smelly stuff. You know, butchering an animal isn't a, a, a pleasant job. And that's what they had to do to get rid of their sins. They had to really get in there and endure the stench, the work, the blood, the stain, everything from that. I've known it from a little child. You butcher uh, a side of beef in your garage, you don't get the smell out of that garage for years. It stays in there, and it's nasty. It smells nasty. Uh huh. For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of an heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctifieth to the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? Hebrews is an amazing study, uh, and it just goes on and on and on like this and gives you all those good things. Uh, Hebrews 10, 14 through 17 says this, For by one offering, Jesus Christ, he has perfected forever them that are sanctified. When you're sanctified, you are made absolutely pure and holy, and you're set apart from the world. You're set apart from the devil. You're set apart from sin, sickness, and disease. You are to come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. That's what the word says. Some more lights coming on now? Mm -hmm. 
The Lord didn't say, well, just sort of keep doing what you're doing, repent once in a while and I'll receive you. No. He said, come out from among them and be you separate and touch not the unclean thing and I will receive you. That was his requirement. Mm -hmm. Whereof the Holy Ghost also is a witness to us, for after that he had said before, this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their hearts. In other words, you won't need some highfalutin religious leader to come down on you, you and try to remind you, oh, you're a sinner and you're this and you're that and you need to do this and you need to do that in order to be a true believer. Mm -hmm. You'll already know. It'll already be in your mind, in your heart. You won't need anybody else to tell you, you've got to do this and you've got to do that. But if a man or woman of God has to bring his correction for something that you're unaware of, that's what you'll need at the time. But generally speaking, 99.9% .9 of the time, it'll be in your hearts and in their minds will I write them and their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. Mm-hmm. If you do have a little screw up before God, all you have to do is just say, oh, Lord, forgive me. I'm never going to do that again. I didn't realize what I was doing. I sort of got in over my head and I made that mistake. Now, don't, don't ever let me do that again. That's all you got to do. And he goes, okay, I'll forget about it. And Jesus tells God the Father, oh, don't bring any punishment on him. He's already told me he's going he's gonna to straighten up and fly right. He's, he's going to do just fine. Just back off. <laughs> That's, that's what Jesus does for you, man. He stands in the gap for you and says, all right. Yeah, he's, uh, he's made his atonement. He knows what to do now, and he'll, he'll be fine from here on out. Yeah, it's a wonderful thing. Mm -hmm. And this just goes on and on. It is God that girdeth me with strength. He clothes you with it and makes my way perfect. Uh -huh. In Ephesians, Paul, remember I was talking about apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers? It's called the fivefold ministry, and that's what this ministry is. It is a fivefold ministry. We have apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. All of those things. Why? Because that's how God set it up. Now, I'll tell you the difference between the fivefold ministry and other so-called ministries out there. I've got n nothing against anyone out there that's sincere. Okay, I'm talking about the wrong spirits that are, have crept in and perverted pure religion mm -hmm. and taken away people's salvation rather than give them salvation. Here's the difference. Most religious organizations out there think they can get away with just a pastor and a teacher, maybe a so-called evangelist. But what they leave out today are the apostles and prophets. They'll tell you a lie like this. There is no one that can fill the fulfill the role of an apostle or a prophet in these days and ages. In other words, that was just for the old apostles back there. There's no one that can do it today. There's no one that can be... Um, holy enough to do it today. Nobody can do it. That's a lie of the devil, a religious devil that's called a religious spirit that tells lies and substitutes those lies for the truth. All right, are we clearing the clouds out now? I hope so, because there, there's a lot that, that needs to be cleared out so that the true light can now shine. You get all the, the dirt, the dust, and the mire and all the, every wind of doctrine out of the way. Every wind of doctrine, all that hot air blowing out. Mm -hmm. The word calls them clouds without water. Well, what's a cloud that doesn't have any water? Well, it must be just a bunch of hot air that doesn't have any water of the word in it. it. Doesn't have any spirit to it. It's just a puff of hot air. See what I mean? He says, be no more children tossed to and fro with every wind of doctrine. Be you no more children. You're going to start out and come to the Lord as a little child. And then you're going to grow up into maturity. Perfect also means mature. Perfect also means that that part of you that is occupied by maybe something other than the Holy Spirit or the lack of that Holy Spirit, when you become full of the Holy Spirit, it fills that part of you that was empty and then completes you, makes you whole, and that 
makes you perfect, complete, and whole. How about that? Isn't that good? <laughs> mm -hmm. If you've been in religious settings and been taught by religious organizations, forget everything and start over. That's what God is requiring right now. Start over. You must unlearn what you've learned. Mm -hmm. That's a quote from Yoda. I don't know where I got that, but he was right on that point. Uh huh. Mm -hmm. See what I mean? Let's see if we can get through Acts 2. <laughs> oh boy, what a journey that is. It's kind of a, you know, we take all kinds of other roads here. But this is necessary for you guys to, this is what the Lord has for you during this time. Okay? Uh, verse 28, the Old Testament says, Thou hast made known to me the ways of life. Thou shalt make me full of joy with thy countenance. This is interesting. I'm going to explain this. I think Peter's still talking here. Yeah. Peter is quoting from the Old Testament. He's quoting uh, David from the Psalms. And uh, I'll tell you something a little bit about David. King David was a man after God's own heart. He knew how to get God's attention. And he knew so much, even in the Old Testament, about the coming Messiah, the coming of, of Jesus Christ, and actually knew about the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. In Psalm 51, he said, Take not thy Holy Spirit from me. In the Old Testament, the men of God would have the Holy Spirit come upon them to get the work of the Lord done, and then it would go back where it came from. In the New Testament, Jesus sent it back into us to dwell there permanently, not to be removed or displaced by anything else. Uh huh. Thy countenance, the face of God. A countenance is somebody's face. If you look at me, you're looking at my countenance. And hopefully, I have a joyful countenance, right? Not one that's full of fear, doubt, or any other thing. It's the face, okay, the countenance. The face of God here is Jesus Christ. Back in the Old Testament, Moses asked the Lord, he said, he asked God the Father personally, uh, let me see I want to see you. I want to see your face. And he says, I'm sorry, I can't do that at this time. I'll cover the cave and you'll see my hinder parts as I pass by. But you won't see my face. That face is Jesus Christ revealed. He's the face of God. He's the, the, uh, the captain of the Lord's host. He's the captain of the Lord's armies. He's the one that goes out there in the front lines and does all the fighting. Mm -hmm. He's the expert. He's the master. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> okay full of joy how with Jesus Christ that's the only way you can be full of joy men and brethren let me freely speak unto you of the patriarch David that he is both dead and buried and his sepulcher is with us unto this day therefore being a prophet and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that of the fruit of his loins, according to the flesh, he would raise up Christ to sit on his throne. King David was the physical king over Israel, God's church, if you will. Israel is a type of God's church. If you want to think about it spiritually and symbolically, this is what these things are. Um, Christ, on the other hand, is our physical king, our spiritual king, as well as our physical king. Why not? He's both. Mm -hmm. So Christ sits on his throne. He's the king of the Jews. And Paul said a Jew now is not one outwardly in the flesh or according to his DNA or because of his traditional heritage and cultural heritage, but one inwardly with the circumcision of the heart and the ears. We are actually a true Jews. Do you know that? <laughs> if you want to think about it in certain ways. The Lord will show you all of this in time, <laughs> but it's all good. Uh, he, seeing this, therefore, spake of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell, neither did his flesh see corruption. Yeah. Did you know that if you died right now, your spirit would go on to meet the Lord? That is, if you have the Holy Spirit. Then, when the Lord came back for the rest of us who are alive and remain, 
that resurrection power would bring your dead actual body out, out of that grave, and that's what it does. And then God gives you a body in glory that meets, reunites with your spirit, and he gives you a resurrected body that suits him. The word says, we know not what we shall be like, but we shall be like him, which that's a cool thing. Very cool. So this is what uh, part of what Peter's talking about. Each one of these verses has volumes of information that go along with it. And this is what you'll find when, when you find yourself filled with the Holy Ghost and reading this word and having read through it a couple of times, you will find yourselves spending hours just on one verse alone. <laughs> yeah, word by word. The Lord takes us from faith to faith and glory to glory. That's what the word says. Uh-huh. How do I, you guys are wondering, how does he get so much out of just one verse? Well, it's done under the anointing by the Holy Ghost. It's just that simple, and it's just that easy to do. There's so many good things in each verse of this, it's hard for me to cover it all in just one night. This Jesus hath God raised up, whereof we all are witnesses. <laughs> Therefore, being by the right hand of God exalted, and having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, he has shed forth this which you now see and hear. So the Spirit of Christ is here right now. This is what you're seeing. This is what you're hearing right now. Mm -hmm. For David is not ascended into the heavens, but he saith himself, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou on my right hand until I make thy foes thy footstool. Oh, man. I could do a whole message on just that alone. This is really something, and something powerful. This is something Jesus used to trip the Pharisees up back in the Gospels. Uh-huh. The Lord said unto my Lord. David said, God the Father said to Jesus Christ, my Lord, in other words. David was talking about God the Father speaking to Jesus Christ, his own Lord, a Jesus Christ that hadn't been revealed yet. Yet, David knew by the Holy Ghost who Jesus Christ was to a certain extent. He knew he was the Lord's anointed. He knew he was the Holy One. He knew he was part of the Holy Ghost. He knew about those things and yet couldn't have them permanently. You guys have the opportunity now to obtain things from God that old men of God only had the promise of and couldn't fully obtain. They couldn't get it 100%. And tomorrow, you're going to have the opportunity to go down in that water and get everything that those other guys are still waiting to have. Mm -hmm. Yep. You know, the word also describes that all the old men of God cannot be perfected until we all arrive in glory. Mm-hmm. We get to be the forerunners of old men of God. <laughs> Interesting, isn't it? Uh -huh. That they without us will not be perfected. In other words, they won't be perfected until we are all there. Then they, they get to enjoy their perfection. Their full 100% perfect status. Mm -hmm. And Jesus Christ does make your enemies your footstool. The word also says that Jesus put all things under his feet, especially all those bad things. It's beneath your dignity to serve sin. Mm -hmm. Because if Christ is in you, then he's made all your enemies, those sinful enemies, your footstool. It's beneath your feet. It's beneath your dignity. It's something you look down on and absolutely despise. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sin should be disgusting and absolutely beneath your dignity. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's beneath your dignity to obey sin and the lusts thereof. Yeah. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made that same Jesus, whom you have crucified, both Lord and Christ. He says, the one that you killed is the one that you're supposed to have. Peter is tell, basically telling uh, Jerusalem here, you guys screwed up big time. Very simply put. Now, when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart. They were cut right to the heart. 
and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? Well, how can we get rid of this problem? Well, this is what we we're talking about. This is the focal point now of, of tonight's discussion. What do we do? How do we take care of this problem? Then Peter said unto them, repent, change your mind. Mm -hmm. Switch your own mind out of there, get rid of that. And forget about what that thinks about and get the mind of Christ in there. And be baptized, every one of you. Baptism is necessary. How? In what name? In the name of Jesus Christ. Why? For the remission or forgiveness of sins. And as a side effect, you shall, positive, this is a promise of God, receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Hmm, boy, this is good. Remission of sins means absolute forgetfulness. God forgets everything you did in the past. And with God, you don't have a past, you have a future. All you have is a future, that's it. Mm -hmm. And if you start at the bottom with God, there's nowhere else to go then but up. How about that? Uh huh. You gotta start somewhere. This is what Peter instructed them to do. This is how you get your start with God. I don't care how many false starts you've had. <laughs> it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter to God either. It won't hurt you to get baptized mm -hmm. with, a, with somebody who is filled with the Holy Ghost so that he, they can pass it on to you. And then verse 39 says this, For the promise is unto you and to your children, not just for the old apostles, and to all that are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. And the call is going out. And with many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, save yourselves from this untoward generation. What were, what were they not towards? They, were, they weren't anywhere toward God. That was their problem. And this is how you save yourself from it. This is how you do it. Religion says, well, you've got to do this and you've got to do that in order to be able to obtain this or that, but they don't tell you how. They don't want you to know. They want you to be in confusion. They want you to be in derision in your mind. They want you to, to be, uh, have your brain scrambled like a, a pan full of scrambled eggs. Crooked generation. Untoward means crooked. Remember? You've got to, you know, the way of the Lord is straight and narrow, not crooked. <laughs> uh-huh. Only he can straighten out that crooked path. Then, they that gladly received his word were baptized. Ah. Well, that separates the men from the boys, doesn't it? They that gladly received his word were baptized. And the same day, there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. So now we've got 3,120 souls and a brand new church going. Bless God. <laughs> Isn't that cool? And they continued. Yeah. Continue. Once you start, you don't go, oh, well, I've done everything I needed to do and stop. And that's it. You've got to move on. You've got to really continue in it. But it's an easy thing. When you're ready to have your horns clipped, gentlemen, you go under that water and the Lord puts his yoke down on you very gradually, very, very easy. He said, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. He very, gets you used to it. He lets you test the waters out a little bit and then you go, all right, son, here we go. Let's go. Let's go plow this field. Let's go out there and let's drive this race. Let's go out there and, and run the race with patience. Let's go out there and save these new souls. Let's go out there and minister everything. Mm -hmm. It's neat. It's really neat. And they continued steadfastly. They just kept very steadily doing this in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship. It's important. Some people think they don't need to, to fellowship one with another. They think that they can serve Christ all on their own. No. My hand, if you cut my right hand off, that's no good to my body. My right hand can't uh, receive blood from my heart if it's amputated. See what I mean? We need that fellowship so that we can circulate that blood of Christ. Mm -hmm. 
We're the body of Christ, and the blood of Christ has to circulate between us. Hmm? Okay. Fellowship. And in breaking of bread and in prayers. Have their own communion. It's fine. And fear came upon every soul. The healthy, holy fear of God. I want to make the distinction between the fear of God and any other so-called fear out there. One of Jesus' most simple and short and brief messages to his disciples was two words. Fear not. Any other fear aside from the fear of God. The fear of God, on the other hand, is healthy and holy, just like I said. And the fear of God, the word says, is the beginning of wisdom. Mm -hmm. The Lord is going to give you guys so much wisdom and understanding and knowledge through his Holy Spirit and through his written word that it's mind-boggling. It boggles the mind of man, but it, it, to the mind of Christ, it's a beautiful thing. The most beautiful thing you could ever imagine. <laughs> uh-huh. The fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. The end of Ecclesiastes by a very wise man, the wisest man that ever lived on this earth, until Christ came. <laughs> His name was Solomon, he, and he wrote this. He says, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter after he wrote about the vanity of all the other stuff that's out there and everything he tried and everything that he did apart from serving God. And he said, the, the conclusion of the whole matter is this, that you fear God and keep his commandments. This is the whole duty of man. He knew what the meaning of life is. And it's right in this word. How many people have gone out and, and like Steve said, through uh, Buddha or enlightenment, trying to ob obtain bliss or nirvana, when all they had to do was just read the end of Ecclesiastes. Fear God and keep his commandments. Don't break them. See what I mean? <laughs> Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. Don't break them. Don't be sinners. Keep my commandments. Yeah. Who is my mother, my, my sister, my brethren, my mother and father? Those that hear my words and do them. See? Not, not the ones who are stubborn, rebellious, and, and my words go in one ear and out the other. That's not what he said. And we're just about done, fellas, for tonight. <laughs> this is just the beginning for you guys. <sighs> mm -hmm. And fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done by the apostles, or through the apostles. The Lord's going to do amazing things through you guys when you get full of his spirit. I can't stress it enough. And all that believed were together and had all things common. You know, the communists tried to do that from each according to his ability to each according to his need, but they left God out of it. And it failed miserably. Always does. Falls flat every time. These guys learned how to share everything without, without being greedy or selfish about it, which is kind of cool. And that's what we do uh, as brethren here. With these guys that I know very well, that these guys I've known for decades, um, you know, I can call him up and say, where was that fuse box? He says, oh, I don't know right away where it is. You know, anything like that. Can you guys help me move? Sure. Whatever. We have all things common. Or if he's got something I need, he lets me use it, if, and vice versa. If I've got anything these guys need, they're welcome to it. You see what I mean? And there's no ill will. There's no motives. There's not expecting anything back. There's nothing. It just... It's freely give and freely receive. And this is what these guys were starting to do back here. It's a good example for what we should do. They had all things common. And sold their possessions and goods and parted them to all men as every man had need. There you go. And they continuing daily with one accord, the same mind, in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart. You know, they went from house to house as saints. You know, the saints would meet in different places in saints' homes. Now, when Jesus went and told his disciples, you know, look, go out and minister to the people out there, he told them, go not from house to house. In other words, don't go from door to door and bugging people with your tracks and your weird doctrines. Mm -hmm. 
See what I mean? There's the difference. These saints, you know, went from each of the saints' homes and, and did that. This is one that they use to have an excuse to go house to house, but this is a different meaning and a different application altogether. A religious spirit takes the word and twists it to, to achieve its own agendas. It does. <laughs> well, I've got nothing against Catholics, but Catholics go right against the teaching of Jesus too. When Jesus taught his disciples how to pray, he gave them the Lord's Prayer, you know, um, Our Father, which, oh, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, as, you know, as it is in heaven, so shall it be on earth, etc., etc., etc. And after he told them, he said, you can pray that way. He gave them kind of a good outline how to do it. And right after he did, he said, but make not vain repetitions. Don't make useless repetition out of it. What do the Catholics do? Turn right around and make a vain repetition out of it. You seeing the difference now of what religion does versus what salvation can do for you? Is it becoming a little more clear now? We're getting all the confusion out of there and all the religious garble out of the way so that the true light can now shine through? Mm -hmm. All right. Breaking bread from house to house did eat their meat or their food with gladness and singleness or simplicity of heart. I'll tell you what. Serving the Lord isn't complicated, as the religious natural man out there would have you believe. It's not complex and it's not confusing, and it's not something you have to struggle with. It's not a struggle to serve God. The biggest struggle that you'll encounter out there is trying to serve the world and the devils out there that want you to do it their way. God's way is a lot more simple than that. In fact, it is so simple that most people can't comprehend it. That's where the beauty lies. <laughs> the genius is in the simplicity most times. Oh, that was so simple and yet it was eluding me. See what I mean? The genius is in the simplicity of it. Uh -huh. Keep it simple. Jesus never used large words other than you know, the names of persons, place, or things, never really more than any, any more than two or three syllables even. Kept it real simple. The common people heard him gladly. All the educated, highfalutin doctors of theology back in his day hated him. <laughs> uh-huh. And they hated him because he had superior knowledge of the word than they did. <laughs> Actually, the word was made flesh, and that flesh the word was made into was Jesus Christ. Yeah, in the beginning it was the word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the Word was made flesh. That's Jesus Christ. He was the walking, talking Bible, and they didn't even realize what they had standing in front of them. <laughs> mm -hmm. The big... It would be like, you know, the, all the big guys from the TBN network today, not knowing who and what is standing in front of them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. See what I mean? Verse 47, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily, such as should be saved, or such as were being saved. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that's enough word for tonight. And uh, we'll just continue on uh, next Saturday. Same, same location, same time. You know, and I, again, I don't want to pressure you guys, but the Lord's got a lot for you. And if you miss a meeting, you're going to miss something. And uh, you'll have to catch up then. If, you're, if you really are sincere about it, you'll, you know, you'll, you'll have catching up to do. So um, with that, uh, we'll continue on next time.